in a devotion book titled Today in the Word, some time ago there was a write-up, a story that is about the great conductor of the New York Philharmonic named Leonard Bernstein. He was once asked, the most difficult instrument to play, the most difficult instrument to play. How many of you out there play an instrument? Just by a show of hands. And so, if you were asked that question, even when I just stated that question, you might have had several different things run through your mind. Maybe the instrument you've not yet learned to play, you would say, or maybe one you've tried. Is it a string or, or a woodwind or is it a percussion? Or what is the most difficult instrument to play? When he was asked that question, he did not hesitate. Mr. Bernstein, what is the most difficult instrument to play in the orchestra? He answered, second fiddle. I can get plenty of first violins or violinists, but finding someone to play second fiddle with enthusiasm is a problem. And if we have no second fiddle, we have no harmony. It is difficult in many cases to walk out into a culture that has now taken on arrogance and vanity as a virtue and promote humility as a good thing. It's a funny thing, though, because the Scripture teaches something entirely different. In fact, Scriptures teach that a humble heart, humble attitudes, humility, a humble mind is not only nice, but is necessary to live before God and to live with God. And so this morning, I am reminded that living out my life before God with a humble heart will almost assuredly guarantee me of God's inheritance for me. And so this morning, let's talk a little bit about the great inheritance of a humble heart. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to the book of Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13, as we continue walking through verse by verse, precept by precept, word by word, the book of Genesis. We have met Adam and Eve and we have experienced their heartache as they were cast out of the garden after great sin. We met Cain and Abel and the heartbreak of their parents as one was murdered by the other brother. We have met then Cain's family and some of the dysfunction there. We then met a man named Noah who walked before the Lord and who carried on humanity and really whose family we often say we're all related to Adam and Eve and in many ways that is true, but it is also true that we're all related to Noah. By the time the flood had ended, there was only a handful, eight to be exact, eight people left on earth, and all of humanity has been birthed out of those people. Noah and his wife, and then his three sons and their families. And so, in one sense, we are all one race. And we met those families, and we took a look at some of their trials and travails, none the least of which was the Tower of Babel. i got to tell you, I think some, some get the perception that the flood somehow cleansed everything and humanity started over. And in one sense, we did. But as soon as the flood was over, Noah got drunk and had problems with his kids. And then they raised up the Tower of Babel as a monument to humanity that God had to totally distort and separate. And so the track record ain't that good up to Genesis chapter 12. And then in Genesis chapter 12, we met a very unique man, unique to all the earth, a man named Abram. And Abram was approached by God and given those instructions we all want to hear. I want you to go somewhere. I'm not going to tell you where it is. I want you to go for a while. I'm not going to tell you how long. And I want you to do something, but I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. We all want to hear those instructions, don't we? If I got up at the end of this service, we're actually going to do an affirmation of our, our education nominating committee report, Sunday school, Awana, children's choir, all those positions. If I got up here and said, we want you to serve somewhere, not going to tell you where. We want you to serve a certain amount of time, not going to tell you how long. And we want you to serve in a certain place, not going to tell you where that place is. I probably would get no volunteers, right? 
But Abram did, and so Abram took off with his family, with his, <laughs> with his nephew Lot, who wasn't all that great of a prize himself. And so we come to, to Genesis chapter 13. By the way, even Abram, that great man of faith and that great man that we follow now, we saw last week that sometimes even the most abandoned person can mess up. <laughs> Abram went down to Egypt and lied to the Pharaoh about his wife and put his wife at risk, his family at risk, put the, the nation at risk. And so he messed up, but he's back on track by Genesis chapter 13, which is where we will pick up today. Genesis chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Good news. Back in chapter 12, Abram went down to Egypt without consulting with God, without building an altar, without worship. Abram's back on track again. He's building altars and worshiping again. Verse 5, Lot also who went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. Business was good. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. Just to give you a historical perspective. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me. Uh, it's very important to note that Abram takes the lead on this deal. And between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren, is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes, or lifted his eyes, and saw all the plain of Jordan, that is, around the Jordan River that feeds down into the Dead Sea. It starts up at the northern part of Israel in the Sea of Galilee. And around that area, around the river, which would have been a logical uh, a, a logical look because around the river would have been fertile land. There would have been a water source. And so Lot looked at that, and it was well watered everywhere, parenthetically, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. After the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, things changed a little bit in that area, but we'll look at that later on down the road. Like the garden of the Lord, the land of Egypt, as far as you go toward Zoar, then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. Ultimately, that, and eventually that will include Lot's land too. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelled by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. There are a lot of things we can look at in this passage, and we will, but every passage, every section of Scripture has a main principle, a main thought. Every passage that you look at, every body of thought has a main thought, a main principle. And uh, what, what I call the main point of the passage when I'm sermon developing, when I'm teaching sermon classes and we're talking about how to build messages, one of the things we look at is the main point of the sermon or the main point of the passage and then the main point of the sermon. The main point of the passage is this, a man living out a life with a humble heart. And as we watch him, as we watch him, we are going to learn we're going to be introduced to a few images of a humble heart. Picking up in verse 1, let's consider the images of a humble heart. 
Going back to verse 1, it says, Abram went up from Egypt. Again, that is both a geographical route. From, a- from Egypt, he would go north back into the promised land where he was supposed to be. I know it's not the promised land yet. I know it will be the promised land when Moses and then Joshua. But the geographical area where Abram will dwell is actually in the area we know of as Israel. We know of as the promised land. It will be referred to that or referred to the, as the promised land after Egypt. This is pre-Egypt, long before the, 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 uh, the bondage in Egypt by the Israelites. This is actually Abram coming out of Egypt after he'd messed up going north. So he's not only going geographically north, but good news, folks, if those of you who were here last week will know that Abram is also going spiritually north. He's coming out of, an, uh, of a time in his life that was, could be described as disobedience. And so here he is with Lot. And verse 2, Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold. Crystal shared earlier that one of God's, part of God's heart is to care for those who are the most vulnerable in our culture. And back in the Old Testament days, it was widows and orphans. I'm not so sure that's not about the same today, particularly orphans. God, God, God despises when we take advantage of the most vulnerable, which is just yet another uh, reason I despise the act of abortion. It's the most vulnerable in our culture. And so he, here we have uh, Abram and Lot uh, going out, and they are very, very wealthy. And so sometimes if we're not careful, we might mistake God's heart for the poor with the idea that God only loves poor. And if you have money or if you have wealth, somehow you are less than loved by God. That is certainly not the case. You say, well, Pastor Johnny, Jesus said that it's easier for a rich man, uh, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to be saved. Yep, Jesus said that. Well, Pastor Johnny, isn't he saying that it's impossible For a rich man to be saved? Yes, he is. That's exactly what he's saying. Can a camel, literally, I mean a real camel, like that camel on the Geico commercial talking about hump day. You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about one of those camels. Fit through the eye of a needle. I don't even care if it's a knitting needle to fit that big camel through that little needle. Pastor Johnny, wasn't he just using a metaphor there? I don't think so. I think he's literally speaking of a big camel, a a living, breathing, snorting, smelly camel going through a needle. You say, well, Pastor Johnny, that is impossible. Exactly. So then, was Jesus saying that it is impossible for rich people to go to heaven? Yes, he was. Thankfully, right after that passage, Jesus comes back and says, but with God, all things are possible. Good news about the impossible, God specializes in that. And so... The issue is not that God does not like wealthy people. The issue is that wealthy people probably have more that makes it more difficult for them to understand their need of God. See, salvation is when we come to a point of recognizing our desperate need of God. But if I'm very wealthy, it might be hard when I look around at my home and my pool and my cars and my 401k and my income and my 52-inch plasma TV with a projection on it. I guess if you have a plasma TV, you don't need a projection. But I got both because I'm so rich and I look around at all this stuff and I think I don't need God. Why would I need anything? And that's the difficulty for a wealthy person. Not that they're loved by God less. It's just that they have so much, they don't recognize their desperate need. I had a friend of mine who planted a church out in Southern California and he said it was a neighborhood where the home's This was 15 years ago. It's a neighborhood where the signs, the for sale signs said homes from the 400s, homes from the 500s, homes from the 700s. And you know what I mean. That's where the starting prices on those homes. And he said, it's the most difficult ministry I've ever done. So they're great people. And as I talked to them, they're very cordial and very kind and polite. He said, but they just don't see their need of God because they're so wealthy. So here's the thing. It's not that wealthy people are less loved by God. It's just that it is a great challenge to recognize your desperate need of God when you're rich. When you don't got nothing, you know you got needs. (laughs) But Abram, if you note here, was a very, very wealthy man. So one of the first heroes of the Old Testament was rich. Had a lot of money. 
And so Abram was very rich in life. By the way, neither would I say that if that any Christian who's poor is somehow out of the will of God. It just depends. That's God's determination. Whether you're rich, poor, or whatever. Not one, one's not more loved than the other or less loved. It's just God determines where we go in life. Verse 3. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning. He's going back to where he came from. I could do a whole message on the fact that sometimes when we walk away from God, which, by the way, Abram did in Genesis chapter 12, sometimes you go, well, what do I do, pastor? Maybe you need to go back where you started. <laughs> Maybe you need to go back and see where did you leave off from God and go back there. <laughs> and that's what Abram is doing. He's getting back to where he was. He's getting kind of back to the fundamentals. Pastor Johnny, what do I do? I feel like I've drifted from God. Well, I'll tell you what, get in the Word and get before the Lord in prayer. Well, Pastor, that's what I always hear. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's a very fundamental thing. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of a, a one, maybe two trick pony. It's get back to God's Word and get before Him in prayer, get in fellowship. Crystal said it very, very well. So there, it's not really rocket science. And so here, Abram is just going back to where he was. He's getting back to the place. And then verse 4. To the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And Abram called on the name of the Lord. By the way, if you go back to Genesis chapter 12 verse 10 where Abram decided to take his family down to Egypt, there's no record of him ever consulting with the Lord about that. <laughs> and so he goes back to the altar that he'd left when he went down to Egypt. But watch this. The image of a humble heart. We look at these verses and we see a wealthy, wealthy man. In fact, in some ways he's even wealthier now leaving Egypt than when he came down because the Pharaoh gave him a bunch of stuff just to leave. <laughs> And then he gave him some stuff while he was in Egypt when he was lying to faith. So uh, apparently Abram got even blessed financially when he was in disobedience to God. Which again, your, your, the, the level of your bank account does not necessarily determine whether you're obeying God or not. But nevertheless, Abram was wealthy, wasn't he? A man of position, a man of power. And yet what we're going to find is a man of a very humble heart. So that reminds me of this. You ready? A humble heart does not depend on personal status. You can be a famous person and be humble and a no-name and be arrogant. You, you can be the most plain, generic of people and be humble and a famous person and have no humility at all and be prideful and vain. Your position does not determine the condition of your heart. And so we see here a man who was humbly walking before the Lord with, with wealth and power. Wealth, reputation, importance, or position of person does not determine whether or not they have a humble heart. Humble heart is expressed from a person whose life is fully given to Christ. And when it is, here's what will happen. We'll begin to care about other people more than ourselves. It's a life abandoned to Christ, so then it becomes abandoned to serving others. See, we, we mistakenly think humility is running myself down. In fact, that's really not humility. That's really pride. Pastor Johnny Howe, I'm going to tell you in just a minute. But I came across a story of a young preacher boy from a preaching journal. It seems that the young preacher was excited and proud to be preaching his first sermon in his home church. All his family was proud of him, patting him on the back. We're so proud of you. You're a fine young man going to become a preacher boy. And he was just so proud. He knew that all of his family and friends would be there that day and they would think this was great. And on that Sunday morning, he was introduced to the congregation and he walked boldly to the pulpit, head high, radiating self-confidence. And he proceeded to stumble through reading the scripture, lost his train of thought halfway through the message. He was a young preacher, so he began to panic a little bit. <laughs> he did the safest thing. He ended the message very quickly prayed and walked down dejectedly with his head down, his self-assurance was completely gone. One of the godly men in the church, one of the godly older men in the church, came to him later and said, Son, i got to tell you, if you'd gone up into the pulpit the way you came down, you might have came down the way you went up. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, but it does not depend on your position. I've known some wealthy people who are arrogant and some powerful people who are humble. And I've known some people who had no position at all who were self-focused and vain. And I know some people who have no position who were walking humbly before the Lord. 
The image of a humble heart does not depend on personal status. Look at verse 5. Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. You know the deal about Lot? I, I get the sense that he may not fully appreciate the fact that he is flourishing because of his uncle Abram. I just get that sense. I get the sense that Lot's one of those guys who may really feel like he, he has achieved all this. stuff. I'm sure he's worked hard at it. Don't get me wrong. But I get the sense that he does not fully appreciate all that his uncle Abram has done for him. And maybe he thinks what he has has done. That's just my speculation. I mean, Scripture does not explicitly point that out. But just giving, given the context of events, I, just, I get that impression. Verse 6. Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together. You got, they got so many sheep, so many cattle, so many herds, so many family members. It was just too much. That's a lot. And, and, and so they, it, they, they're going to have to spread out, right? There are not enough natural resources to support that many people and animals. And so what would naturally happen? Lot had people working for him. Abram had people working for him. Lot had sheep herders and, and shepherds. And Abram had shepherds. And he was paying them. And Lot was paying his. And they are going to be loyal to, to the one what pays their paycheck every week, right? And, and so Lot's people were trying to protect his sheep. And Abram's t- people were trying to protect his stuff. And they got to going back and forth. And there was conflict, verse 7. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And just as a historical marker, by the way, the Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land, so now you've got to add them in too. So you got Abram, you got Lot, you got the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and there was just too much going on for them all to stay together. But here's the thing. Abram had been walking in humility, right? Abram had been walking before the Lord. We see that here in the text of Scripture. He was a worshiper of God. But can I tell you something? Just because you walk in humility does not necessarily mean that it will eliminate all strife from your life. Here's an image of a humble heart. Not only does it not, not necessarily depend on status or position, but it does not dispose of petty strife. Sometimes you can walk before the Lord in humility, and, and guess what? Not everybody appreciates a humble heart. <laughs> in fact, some people see an opportunity to take advantage of someone who has a humble heart. So, sometimes people see an opportunity to do that which is hurtful to that person they see as vulnerable and as well you might be. But I'm telling you, walking with a humble heart does not necessarily dispose of petty strife. So don't be shocked if you're seeking to walk before the Lord and things come up. Maybe someone, look, maybe someone you are trying to help and they take advantage of you, Amen. break your heart. That's the thing about ministry. It's inconvenient. It'll break your heart. It's difficult. People don't always respond like you think they should. But I got to tell you, there's no better place to be. But I see so many people who come in thinking they're there to serve, and when they get treated like servants, they leave. (laughs) You were never a servant in the first place. And, And so a humble heart does not necessarily dispense with strife. So can I tell you something? If you're involved in seeking the Lord, serving the Lord, just anticipate that there could very well be all kinds of foolishness happening, all kinds of strife, all kinds of difficult times. But just because I'm walking before the Lord in a humble heart, He did not guarantee me there wouldn't be trouble. Crystal, I think you know that. As you go into Belize, it's, I, we, we would anticipate Crystal's going to serve the Lord. She's giving up a lot, right? So she gets down there, it should all come smoothly together. Doubtful. Doubtful. Pastor Johnny, don't say that. Well, listen when, Je- listen, when Jesus trained his disciples to go out two by two, if you go back into, I think, Matthew 16, he's training them to go out two by two. It's also in the other gospels. Here's what he tells them. He says, you're going to go. People are going to kick you out, knock you down, say things about you, run you out of town. And if I can get some people who want to do that, then I've got some servants who can go out. And so Jesus was always very honest about the context. Sometimes in the church we say, listen, if you'll come serve... You only have to serve once a month in the nursery. Look, how about this? We need people who have a heart to minister to babies. And it may be that you're in there every single week. And they may poop on you. They may pee on you. They may, they may cry and scream. Listen, church might go late and then the baby starts screaming. 
And if you want to be a part of that and pour your life into these babies, come on. That, that is how we should present ministry. Because if you're a servant, it doesn't matter. And so a humble heart does not dispose of petty strife. Ask Moses, leading a group of two or three million people, let him out of bondage. You would think if he never did another thing for him, they'd be so thankful for being let out of Egypt that they'd be celebrating, build a statue to Moses, right? He was leading them toward the promised land. And at various times, Moses was attacked verbally. He was criticized. He was threatened with bodily harm. He was forced to listen to grumbling and griping and criticism. And yet, you know what Numbers 12 says? Numbers 12 says this. Now, the man Moses was very humble. Listen. Now, the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. And yet, he probably had to face more strife than anybody on earth. A humble heart does not dispose of petty strife. Let me tell you something. If you are considering today, maybe it's time for me to give my heart to the Lord. It requires humility. It requires an act of humility. It requires you to say, Lord, I cannot get to God on my own. I have sinned and my sin has separated me from you. So, Lord, I recognize the only way I can have a relationship with you, the only way I can get to heaven is based upon the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the only way. And so maybe you're here today and you're beginning to say, you know what, I, I, I need to give my life away to the Lord. That is an act of humility, by the way. Now, if you were to do that today, let me just be very, very clear to you, that that does not necessarily mean that all of a sudden, if you were to come today and confess your sin and turn to God and be born again, that does not necessarily guarantee that the circumstances of your life will get better. In fact, they could very well get worse for all I know. Amen. Nothing guarantees that strife and difficult times will somehow go away because you walk with a humble heart. Pastor, are you trying to talk us out of walking with the Lord? Well, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I tell you, if you're, if you're going to build a house, would you please figure out how much it's going to cost before you start? Or you're going to get halfway through, you're going to run out of money, the house is going to sit there unbuilt, and everybody's going to ride by and laugh at you. Count the cost before you start building them. If you're going to fight a battle, figure out how big your army is. Figure out how big their army is. And before you go into battle, why don't you figure out what it's going to cost you to do it before you get in the middle of the battle and you're like Custer and all your soldiers get killed and you have no hope of returning. So he said, count the cost. It is the same in the Christian life. Before you determine to give your life to Christ... And I pray you would today. But before you determine to understand, Christ is offering you far more than you'll ever get from the world. But it does not necessarily guarantee that he will remove all strife from your life. It does not dispose of petty strife. A humble heart does not. And then look at verse 8. So Abram said to Lot... Abram initiates the transaction that is about to take place. He is the leader. Let me clarify something. The word leadership is never used in the Bible not a single time. Let that sink in. There's a whole division of Christian teachers who are doing leadership conferences. And I understand what they're saying, but I'm just saying the word leadership is never once used in the scriptures. You don't believe me? Well, then be like the Bereans. Go check me out after today. If I'm wrong, come back and tell me. The word leadership, one time, depending on the translation, uh, the word leader could be used in one of the gospels. But bottom line is leadership is, I'll tell you what is used, servanthood. Amen. All the time. And so here's Abram, and guess what he does? He's the lead servant. He goes to Lot and says, I'll tell you what, listen, we, we cannot coexist here. There's not enough land. There's not enough grass. There's not enough stuff for animals. So <clears throat> here's what we're going to do. I'm taking that. You get what's left over. No, that's not what he said. <laughs> Honey, I, I brought you a biscuit. And we look down. Here's the biggest one. Here. <laughs> <laughs> he, he says, look, I'm going to let you pick where you want to go. And then whatever's left, I'll take. Let me tell you what that is. That is a leader. Because he's the lead servant. 
husbands, in your, in your families, you are the lead servant. You're the lead servant. You serve your wife. You serve your family. You're a boss, a manager. You're the lead servant. So Abram says, Lot, I'll tell you what, you take, take whatever you want, I'll take what's left. Verse 9, is, is not the whole land before you? Abram tells him, separate it. He, he gives him all that. Verse 10, and Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the plain of Jordan. And here's Lot, all right? Watch that. Here's Lot. He's going to take whatever looks the best on the outside. Lot is a superficial human being. He's going to find out what looks the best. He's going to find out what looks the nicest. Now, whether or not it's anything that honors God, I don't think Lot really cared about that. Whether or not it's anything that that has any real substance, in fact, what we're going to find out is when it's all said and done, Lot's choice didn't have much substance anyway. And so Lot chooses the, the Jordan plain that looked good. Here's the problem. It shows the great contrast between Lot and Abram. And Lot still hadn't learned the lesson of his uncle Abram. But Abram, Abram was taking a chance, wasn't he? Take whatever you want, and I'll take what's left. Abram was taking a chance. But watch this, a humble heart. Here's an image of it. It does demonstrate personal sacrifice. A humble heart demonstrates personal sacrifice. Hum- Listen, humility, let me, let me clarify again what humility is. Humility is not my attempt to belittle myself. Here, when I, let me say that again. Humility is not my attempt to belittle myself. Let me tell you why. Because when I belittle myself, it's still about self. You may not have known this, but if I'm sitting around belittling myself, I'm still focused on self. That's not humility. Humility is not self-focused at all. By the way, those who run themselves down speak of how bad they are, how weak they are, how ugly they are, how untalented they are. Two things they're doing. Number one, you're undermining God's creation. Number two, you're still focusing on yourself. Humility is not me running myself down, but it is simply me caring more for the success of others than myself. Now, there are times that humility costs me personally, just like it did Abram. A lack of humility resists personal sacrifice. I'll I'll tell you what, think of this past week, even small things. (laughs) You ever gotten out of your car, going into the restaurant on Sunday, just came out of church, message on humility? You get out of your car, other family gets out of their car, there's already a line. Uh huh. You know why we're laughing. I'm going to get there first. That's a very small, trite example. Humility is, humility is prepared for personal sacrifice. There's a, a mom was preparing pancakes for her sons. Kevin, who was five, came across this story, by the way, in a Christian Journal. Kevin, who was five, and Ryan, who was three. She was preparing pancakes. And the boys began to argue over who would get the first pancake. Kevin, who was five, Ryan, who was three. They were arguing who would get the first pancake. Well, that's not only normal, it'd be abnormal probably if they weren't, right? Their mother saw an opportunity for for a lesson. She said, if Jesus were sitting here, he would say... Let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. Kevin, the five-year-old, turned to his three-year-old brother and said, Ryan, you be Jesus. Humility is prepared for personal sacrifice. And guess what? I don't even sacrifice with my teeth gritted. I do it with joy when there's a humble heart. If you cannot experience personal sacrifice with joy on your heart, then maybe the prayer should be, God, I want a humble heart, but I'm not there yet. Help me. Now watch this, verse 14. 
And the Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him. Now he's got, hey, Abram, come over here. Let me talk to you alone. <laughs> Lot's gone. And God verifies to Abram the promise he had made to him back in Genesis 12. And pick up in verse 16, just for the sake of time. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise and walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built what? And an altar through Genesis is a symbol of what? Worship. Let me tell you what humility is about. The picture of humility that we're talking about. The images of humility. It certainly does not depend on personal status. One image. It certainly not, does not necessarily dispose of petty strife. Humility. Humility does not necessarily dem- or humility does demonstrate personal sacrifice. But let me tell you about humility. It does deliver peace with the Savior. Humility delivers peace with the Savior. Job 5.11 He sets on high those who are humble and those who mourn are lifted to safety. Psalm 9 When he avenges blood, he remembers them and he does not forget the cry of the humble. Psalm 25, the humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. Psalm 147, the Lord lifts up the humble, he casts the wicked or the proud to the ground. Matthew 18, then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself... As this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Folks, I don't have time to read all the passages in Scripture that call us to humility. God opposes the proud. And He gives grace to the... Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. On and on we could go. Let me tell you something. Humility is the only vehicle by which you will have peace with the Savior. You must acknowledge, God, I am in desperate need of you. God, I am in desperate need of the saving power of Jesus Christ. I must recognize that before I can even begin a relationship. And then once I've begun, Christian, I'm recognizing every day of my life I'm desperately dependent upon Jesus. Imagine being born to a family that was prominent in your church. And you were born to much fanfare and attention because that family was prominent. They were leaders in the church. I mean, some of the main leaders. <clears throat> and because of the, the details, the unique details surrounding your birth, you're seen as sort of a golden child. All of your family. Imagine this, if, if this were you. All of your family and their friends and church friends anticipate great things from your life and great service to the Lord. In fact, there are some supernatural events that happen around your birth that verify you will be a special, special child. You're raised into adulthood, everyone anticipating great things from you. And then something seems to get a bit off track. You begin to follow what you believe is God's will for you, but it isolates you from most of your family and friends and church members. Your family, friends, and colleagues begin to tag you as strange and offbeat. You get a bad reputation. Finally, you're about 30 years old, and you begin a ministry. It draws a lot of attention at first. And while it draws a lot of attention, it is still a ministry that's completely unlike what your family or friends expected of you. Your followers, they increase quickly. Just imagine if this were you. Your followers increase quickly in just a few months. I mean, three, four, five months, your followers increase. And your popularity skyrockets in the six-month time period. And at six months, you are cruelly, unfairly, unjustly murdered. That's the end. And just imagine you spent three decades preparing God allowing you to enter this ministry and then you're murdered after six months in that ministry. How horrible would that be? 
And your family and friends, they think, oh, what could have been? What a waste of a good person. And yet the Savior says this. That is the purpose for which you were born. And if you could put yourself in that place, you'd be a lot like John the Baptist who said, I must decrease and he must increase. He spent 30 years preparing for a ministry that lasted six months. And he said, this six-month period is why I exist. And am I okay with that if that's what God chooses for me? If I'm walking humbly before God? Absolutely. <clears throat> One of the great roadblocks probably to worship is hearts that are not humbled before the Lord. One of the great roadblocks to seeing lost people saved are lost people who are resisting God's call to salvation, His call to love. And I'm just saying, this morning may be a good time for you to respond and get before the Lord and say, Lord, maybe I don't have a humble heart yet, but God, I want it. Listen, that's not such a bad place, folks. Maybe, you don't, maybe you're not really there, but you want to be there. Okay, start that place. Start where you are. In just a moment, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask you to, to respond. And maybe you need to come and get at this altar, and maybe you need to get before the Lord and say, Lord, humble my heart. Help me to understand what I need to do. Maybe you need to say, Lord, I need to know how to be saved. Maybe, maybe your humbling is no more than saying, Lord, you're calling me to be a part of this church, and I need to humble myself and come and be a part of it. Maybe you need to humble yourself before another person, before a friend. Maybe there's some situation in your life, and you know why you won't get out of your pew? Because you're afraid what people will think, and you need to humble your heart and come. And I want you to stand right now, and I'm going to pray. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, we ask you that you would speak to our hearts and we would respond with humble hearts in your humility by the power of the Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name.